in a, in a wonderful and very famous uh, fragment, Heraclitus says this, A lifetime is a child, a child playing. The kingdom belongs to a child. The child is a kind of candidate for this basic principle. And there, too, Heraclitus is playing with words. The child playing in Greek is pais, paisdom. The word for play in Greek is related to the word for child. So how do we resolve this? Think of it, about it this way. What do these three things, fire, war, and play, have in common? What they seem to have in common, at least to me, is that they're all in motion. They're all in a very specific kind of motion. Their motion is very unpredictable. Why is it that we love looking at a fire? It's because it dances, it crackles. It, you, you can be entranced by a fire because it's in this wildly, beautifully unpredictable motion. That's why it's interesting. War, certainly among the most unpredictable of human enterprises, regardless of how much technology or what a great advantage one side might have over another, uh, we can't predict the outcome of a war. Perhaps most significantly, the notion of the child playing. What in the world would it mean to say, as Heraclitus says, the kingdom belongs to a child, to a child playing? I think here, just reflect a little bit on what it's like for a child to play, especially a very young child. A young child plays with the imagination. For a young child, any object whatsoever can become a plaything. Children play without rules. They simply play. If, a, if two ch uh, children start a game, uh, certainly one thing that often happens is that the rules will change. There is a kind of, as in the cases of war and the case of fire, a kind of beautiful, unpredictable, rhythmic motion in the child playing. Contrast the child's play with the play of adults. When adults play, they play rule-bound games, games that are highly structured and tightly regulated. This is precisely what children don't do. They live in the world of the imagination. They build up worlds. They destroy worlds. They play in a sandbox. They can create a game out of nothing and then tear it apart. They just play and play. I would argue that it's in these fragments, and in particular, we might say, in the relationship of these fragments to each other, or we might even say in the play of these various fragments with one another that we get the real power of Heraclitus's Logos. It is a Logos which contradicts itself. It is a Logos which moves. It's a Logos which plays. When, when Heraclitus says that it is not possible to step twice into the same river, and then he says, we step and we do not step into the same river. It's possible he had this in mind. Uh, I live in Boston, and the river I look out on from my office is the Charles River. Even if it's true that it's always changing, always has the same name. I always call it the Charles River. One of the great temptations to think that there is stability in this world is language especially in this case, nouns. If I call that body of water that I see outside my office the Charles River, I'm tempted to think that that phrase, the Charles River, is referring to one stable entity. After all, every day of the week, I give it the same name. It is the Charles River. However, that naming of the river is an illusion, or at the very least, it's profoundly misleading. It would suggest that there is a stable entity behind the name. This is precisely, I would argue, what Heraclitus is urging us to reject. The name is a seduction. The name is potentially misleading. Language itself, as it's normally used, is deeply misleading. 
This is why, I would argue, and here I believe Nietzsche would agree with me, this is why Heraclitus wrote in such a peculiar fashion. He, his very writing is meant to disrupt our ordinary understanding of language. We don't ordinarily expect to encounter someone saying, changing, it rests, or war is the father of all things. Play is somehow the king. The child playing is the king. These, these are disruptive, perplexing sentences that are meant, I think, to destabilize the language itself so that the language itself gets into motion. And thereby, even as it contradicts itself, even as it, it uh, plays against itself, it becomes most expressive in this highly unusual way.